Good morning, everybody. We are at the top of the hour and going ahead. We will go ahead and get started now. Uh, welcome to Net DevOps Live. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, joining me today is Adam Radford. Adam will be taking us through an exploration of the DNA Center APIs for northbound interaction and all of the different possibilities that we have there. As always, we will be covering Q&A in the question and answer panel. And as always, if you're looking for the slides or links to code samples and other resources, please be sure to uh, just check the webinar resources up on the website. I will drop a link directly to that in the chat panel in just a moment. And with that, I'll hand it over to Adam to kick us off. Thanks. Thanks very much, Hank. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, as you can see from my uh, screen, it's uh, three o'clock in the morning Australian time, but uh, I'm sure it's a much nicer time in, uh, in other places around the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, my name's Adam Radford, been around and involved with DNA Centre for a considerable amount of time and, and APQM before before that, so being involved with uh, device programmability and controllers in, at Cisco for, for quite a while. Um, purpose of today, what I really wanted to do was to uh, cover off um, a little bit about DNA Center. I'm going to assume that people tuning in have some familiarity, so this is not going to be a, a DNA Center 101. Um, all I'll really say about DNA Center is it's the controller Cisco has been working on for the, the campus and WAN devices, so wired wireless um, in a campus context. And what I really want to talk about is the, the APIs, which we're, we're just opening up. So looking at uh, some of the things that you can do with those APIs. And the approach that I've taken here is it's really a life cycle approach. So looking at the, the life cycle of devices from day zero onboarding um, through to day one configuration change through to day two um, assurance uh, and understanding how the network is performing through to the, the optimization phases in, in day N. As I mentioned, um, you know, this is the approach that, that I want to take in terms of the APIs. If I think about what DNA Center is in terms of a controller, it's really an abstraction around how we integrate in and automate the network. So rather than uh, programming the network device by device, uh, DNA Center gives us very much a, a system view of the network as a whole and allows us to interact with uh, the network as a series of devices rather than individual devices in isolation. Um, being an abstraction, there's really two key things that DNA Center allows us to do. One is uh, automation through an abstraction called intent. And what this means is that we've got a way of uh, making those configuration changes in a slightly abstracted way, or actually a very abstracted way. So normally what I would do is if I was pushing out configuration changes to devices uh, directly, I'd have some uh, either model-driven or some sort of CLI uh, template that I would use to push out chunks of configuration to the devices. Uh, in DNA Center, that typically tends to be abstracted and I start to push out uh, an intent. So for example, instead of pushing out a quality of service in terms of class maps, policy maps, etc., what I would do is I would just make a simple statement around WebEx being business relevant, and then DNA Center under the covers would almost compile and uh, create the appropriate configuration to, to realize that intent on all of the network devices that were meant to make sure that WebEx was business relevant. Uh, there's been a lot of focus around automation and uh, particularly in terms of controllers, but one of the things that quickly comes back from customers is that when you start to automate things, you know, how do we know that things are working the way that they're supposed to work? So this whole notion of context and understanding the health of the, the network and how well the network is performing uh, is also a very important context uh, concept. And as you can see, if you start to think about how you can abstract and simplify the information we have around the, the way the network is operating, and then we have an abstracted way of, of interacting with the network and making change, you can start to do some of this closed loop automation around reacting to changes uh, that are occurring in the network. Uh, so that's the high level uh, objective of DNA Center. And obviously we've started to expose APIs that allow us to, to uh, take advantage of some of these capabilities. So the whole point around the APIs is that um, we can either integrate DNA Center into uh, other things. So for example, IT service management tools, uh, we can automate tasks and common tasks in DNA Center. So for example, if I have to create rules for you know, a thousand devices for plug and play onboarding, um, it might be nice if I could use the APIs to automate that. 
Um, and then the other thing we can do with the APIs is, is innovate and do things that DNA Center wasn't necessarily or doesn't necessarily expose right now. Um, and we can make changes to the way that the DNA Center typically operates. So one classic example of that is with the, the policy piece, uh, we could potentially do time of day based policies because we could define a policy that was going to be uh, used at nine o'clock in the morning and then change that automatically to a different policy at five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, for the purposes of this introduction section, uh, what I've done is I've picked out a couple of examples in terms of this device lifecycle. And I've looked at it in terms of the, some of the practical examples that I've been working with customers on around things that they would like to automate. Uh, in terms of where you get access to the um, API documentation, developer.cisco.com is the place that we've, uh, we've stored that documentation. So even within DNA Center, if I go to um, the API documentation button, it actually redirects me to developer. Um, and you can see that we've had a couple of different versions of the, the API. So 125 was the first sort of general availability uh, of the APIs and uh, 126 has just come out. So for those of you who've been using um, the APKM or the early version of the APIs, and there's a lot of code samples and uh, examples on DevNet um, around the, the earlier versions of those APIs, um, all the endpoints are moving. So um, it used to be, the convention used to be slash API slash V1 slash uh, endpoint, so network device or discovery, for example. Um, that's now been prefixed by a, a DNA slash DNA slash intent. So uh, you need to change those. They still both still work, but in the future, you'll have to go through the, the slash DNA slash intent slash API slash V1 um, path. Um, quick question on uh, authentication as that normally comes up. Um, anyone who's familiar with the way that APKM worked, it was a, a post with the username and password in the JSON body. Um, and then you got a response service ticket that came back. Um, with DNAC, it's using basic auth and you'll get a token in response. So you can, the token is actually a, a little bit different to the, the old APK one, one um, but you can see this Postman example is a very simple example of how you can use basic auth to take a username and password and get a token back. Once you have that token, you need to use that in, the, in a header, XAuth token, and then all of your requests will be authenticated uh, using that token. Um, again, on authentication, one of the other questions that comes up is, is there roles-based access? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are four roles that we have to avail available today. One is the network admin role, which allows you to make any changes to the, uh, the network uh, components. There's an observer role, read-only, which is a good way of giving people uh, limited access to uh, a set of APIs that can't really do anything uh, in terms of make changes. And then there's a telemetry admin role and a, a super admin role that are allowed to, to make all changes. So in terms of uh, day zero, um, not sure how many people are familiar with uh, plug and play or network plug and play, but this is a capability that we've been building into all of our products, routing, switching, wireless over the last five years or so. Um, it, it's based on a little agent um, that runs in the devices it has a discovery mechanism. It could be um, DHCP option 43. It could be DNS where it looks for um, a well-known host name for uh, in your particular domain to resolve to DNA Center. Or in fact, more recently, we've added a, a cloud redirect service. So uh, PMP Connect is a, a service that is hosted in, uh, in Cisco's cloud. Um, devicehelper.cisco.com is the sort of path of last resort that the device will use to try and contact um, the uh, cloud service. It will then get uh, a profile back, which is a redirection back to a local DNA center. And then the device will, will phone home to DNA center. And then in DNA center, you can define uh, rules for those devices that will assign either an image or a configuration file or both to that device and uh, essentially onboard it to the network and add it automatically to the inventory of, of DNAC. So this is a, a very popular use case for people getting started with, with DNA Center. The device onboarding um, process is something that people have been challenged with. The nice thing about this is that there's uh, a lot of security built in. So um, security Cisco devices have a secure unique identifier, a SUDI. Um, so that gets validated as part of this um, initial device onboarding. 
as does the uh, DNA Centre also uh, in installs the certificate on the device as well. So it's able to establish a, a secure connection to that device and securely onboard it uh, onto the network. Um, one of the common use cases for this um, is the automation of creating those rules. So essentially, you see what, uh, what I see in, in DNA Centre is a, um, the plug and play application has a, a series of rules where I've got a name of a device, I've got a serial number, I have a product ID, um, and then for that particular device, I can define a template or a, a, an image to, to onboard the device. So if I jump across to my, um, my DNA Center, I can come into the, um, the plug and play application <clears throat> and I'll have a list of network devices that I know about. Now, one of the challenges there is that creating um, these, these devices, um, you can do that through the UI. Um, there, is no, there is a way of bulk uploading these, but there isn't a way today of bulk uploading them and then um, if I'm using a template to define the base configuration, there's no way of defining what the variables of those templates should be. So for example, um, if I was to define a new device, um, I put it onto the network and then I have, I just need to have a serial number, product ID, and a name. I can add and claim that device. And you can see here that I'm able to define a workflow, which is kind of cool because uh, if I'm doing stacking, I can automatically renumber. Um, I can define the image that I want to use if, if appropriate, or I could define a, uh, a template. And if I'm using a template, then one of the challenges is I need to provide the variables for that template. So you notice here that I've been prompted for the hostname variable that that template uses. So the, the problem is that you need to be able to, it would be nice to have an automated way of, uh, of creating those rules and uploading those, those templates variables. So this is a problem that one of my customers had. So I just wrote a, a very simple script to take advantage of the APIs. Um, in terms of the APIs, um, the way that they appear on DNA Center, if you want to get direct access to them, is it's part of what's called DNAC as a platform. So there's a platform layer that sits on top of DNAC that's responsible for exposing these APIs northbound. Um, it's all it's all by default, but underneath that you've got the, the APIs themselves. So I can drill down and this is a very similar list to the one that you saw I would get to if I went um, to the API uh, documentation um, on DevNet. The difference here though is that um, if I was to run these APIs, I can click in on them and I can um, run them locally or I can um, get some sample code. So it's a little bit like the way that uh, Swagger works. Um, I've got the option to, to try it out on a local, um, on a local uh, controller, or I can um, generate sample code. So if I want to get all of the network devices, I, you can see I can generate a code review here. Um, I can select the, the language of, uh, of my choice, which is Python. And that's a very simple way of, of getting some sample code. So as we know from uh, experience, the best way to, uh, to learn to code is to, to take someone else's code and modify it. Um, and also I can try it out here. So again, I can click on uh, to run, oops, and I get the, the number of network devices that are, that are on this, um, this controller. Um, so back to the example, um, the way the file, this works is that there is a, a little uh, configuration file. It's just a CSV file. This contains the name of the device, um, the serial number of the device, the product ID, uh, the name of the workflow. So it'll need to, to look up the name of the workflow. And then the other thing that it has is an instantiation for any of the variables. This is a very simple template. The only thing that, um, or the only variable that the template has is the host name. 
um, and you can see here I've got a very uh, a very simple process of of uh, incrementing each of these by by one so that they're they're different. The serial number has to be unique, um, as does the name, um, and I happen to have made the host names uh, unique as well. But just a very simple example of the the input file. So essentially, what happens when I run the script? Um, I'm going to add and claim. You notice that there are two parts to the plug and play process: is the add device to the inventory, and then there's the claim. And essentially, what the claim does is the claim um, associates the uh, the workflow to the device because I can just add a, a device to the inventory, so I know, sorry to the plug and play system, so I know that it's around, and then I'm able to to claim it, which is essentially assigning it to a workflow of my choice. So if I'm to run this, whoops, and I give it an argument. Um, and I'll do the big test, so I'll do 10 devices. Um, you'll see that it's just going to, to read that file, and then it's telling me that for each of those 10, um, it's going to, to upload them. Now, the way that the script works is that it's just doing it um, one device at a time. The API would allow a bulk import, but just for simplicity purposes, I'm just doing a, a single um, upload at a time. And you notice now, if I come across and take a look at my plug and play application, I should start to see um, those devices being populated and there you go you can see that there's a, a bunch of those devices that have, have been populated um, as the script's run. So the script's completed. Um, one of the other things I wrote was a little uh, script to show the, the um, rendered template. So you know, this particular device, one of my customers that was using this said, well, it's great, but let me, show, let me see what the, the, the configuration is that's going to be pushed out to that device. So this is just showing me the the configuration that's going to be pushed out to the device and you can see here that the uh, the host name uh, has been populated appropriately so this particular device with the serial number was meant to have the host name atom one oh, sorry yeah, atom one and it does so a very simple example of um, of how you can automate those rules so now all i need to do is to plug that device into the network uh, it will discover dnac and it'll be provisioned and onboarded automatically so that's kind of a cool use case in terms of, of getting started uh, so these are the examples. Um, obviously, there is also the uh, the cleanup, which um, I will do. So I can also remove those rules if I wanted to. Um, and being a good citizen, I'm going to remove those uh, those rules from the controller. So a couple of notes. Um, the reason that this came about was there's no way. So this is an example of innovation that it extends the capability of of DNAC. Uh, it allows you to do some things that it doesn't currently do. Um, one note, um, if you look at the way that templates work, uh, these templates can be uh, composite, so I can have uh, an inclusion, and composite templates aren't supported for PMP day zero right now. And then the other thing to take into account is that there, we're going to talk about day one later on. Um, there's a little bit of a design decision to make around how much configuration you put into your day zero configuration versus you know, how much you do day one. So for some people, they want the full config, and that's okay, you can put a full config in. Uh, for some people, for other people, they may have a, a very small bootstrap config, basically just has the basic set of credentials that they want to allow the device to be, to be managed, and then they will use um, the day one process to, to augment that configuration in the way that they want to. But really it's an operational choice in terms of how you, how you break that up. So this is just a quick summary of the APIs. Um, the, the endpoints that I'm using. You notice here in the endpoint, I've left out the slash um, DNA slash intent. And the reason I've done that is that it actually doesn't add anything. It's just a prefix to all of these. So I'm just trying to show you that the, the endpoint that's different, but obviously you would need to, to add that in. Um, for those of you that are interested in, in more detail, um, that code is being published on, on GitHub. Uh, and there's also a series of blogs that I've been writing over the, the last year or so, um, looking at plug and play in particular, but there'll be other ones that I add in 
over the, the next little while. So there's a bunch of blogs that I've uh, been putting together that give you examples around how things work, um, give you sample code that you can uh, can use and, and get started. So this is just a very simple um, example of the blog for the plug and play piece that, that took, takes you to the, the sample code on GitHub and shows you the, the code working and takes you through a bit more detail around the payloads, etc. if you're interested in that. Okay, so the, the next piece is, um, is day one, and this is taking advantage of the template editor in um, DNA Center. So DNA Center has a, a template editor, it's a CLI template at the moment, but it could be extended to other things. Um, it's velocity language that's being used, um, and what you're able to do is through APIs is you're able to take those templates and apply them to devices as you see fit. So one of my customers, a very large customer, is actually just using the template engine in DNAC and then they are using their own Python scripts to uh, take those templates and apply them to devices. Um, the classic use case of that is uh, it, it gets around one of the limitations, or not limitations, but the way that DNAC is designed at the moment, if I was to go into DNAC and look at um, how I use templates, um, I use templates in a, in a profile and I can only have um, one template per profile per device type. So in the design part of DNAC, if I go into a network profile and I have a network profile for switches in my location, um, and where's one I've created earlier? So if I look at the, the binding um, profile here, you can see that uh, I've used a, a template here and I can add um, different templates, but not for, sorry, I can add different templates, but it's difficult then to, to make changes to them. So I can't add, I can add another one here, but I can't necessarily add them um, as easily as I would want because then I have to go through and do the provisioning process again. So there's some challenges with, with how flexible this is because I have to go into the site profile and then add the, the extra templates. So it may be easier to um, just be able to call the template and apply that template directly because what they then need to do is they then need to go into provision and select a device and, uh, and provision that based on its, its location. So if you wanted to use that template engine, but just wanted to use it in your own way, then you can, uh, and that's what the APIs allow you to do. So coming into the template editor, um, the thing you need to know about the templates is that they are versioned. So it's a two-stage commit process. If I look at um, a particular template, um, I can see that I can uh, save it and I commit it, but I need to do a two-stage commit. So I need to save it and I need it to commit it for it to be active. And the reason I do that is that that's what gives me the history. So the history of the template is, is really the commits that I've made and it's no surprise as to where that mechanism comes from. Um, we see that all the time. And what that means is I can actually choose different versions of the template if I want to, as well as get the, the history of the template so I can see um, what, what changed over, over time. So that's the, the template editor. Um, and you notice that there's another concept here, which is a project. So I can create a, a project, which is really like a folder. So it's just um, a container to put templates in. And then within the template, in, within that project, I have a, a series of templates that I can define. Um, when I create a template, uh, the only thing I need to do is give it the device type. So I need to select the, the type of device that it's going to apply. So I can make that very granular and it's very broad in terms of all switches and hubs, or I can go down to a specific um, model of device if I want to. And then the only other thing I need to do is to define the version of, um, of code that is appropriate. So um, which version of I or type of iOS that's, that's used. So that's the only thing I need to do in terms of defining a template. Um, in order to make it a bit easier to manipulate these templates, um, oops, I uh, wrote a, another little utility. So the, the template utility um, 
if you just run it without any arguments, goes and gives you a, a dumping of all the, the templates that are defined. And you notice here I've given you the path. So I, the way I've looked at it is project slash template. So this essentially gives you a path to get to that um, particular template. Um, if I was too interested in a particular template, then I can um, provide that as an argument. And essentially what the script is going to do is it's going to give me all of the information about that template. So in this particular case, um, I got the template ID. Um, everything in DNAC has a universally unique identifier, a 32 character uh, string. Um, you can see the version of the template. So this was version five, and by default it gets the latest version. And then it gives me the body. So it shows me that the body of the template. And the other thing that it does is it pulls out um, any variables. So anything that starts with a dollar is a variable. So there's a dollar prefixes is a required variable and dollar VPN is a required variable. So those are two required variables that I need to provide if I'm going to use um, this template. So the point behind that is that if I then wanted to use the template, I would know which um, variables I would need to, to uh, provide. Um, okay. And to make that easy, um, here's one I prepared earlier. So I'm going to provide uh, this or apply this template um, to this particular device. One of the other things you'll notice um, I've done is um, if you look at the way the, the code works, I tend to dump out the URL of the API call just to let you know what's going on. So you can see that the way that I got this template was I called the API v1 uh, template programmer template API. And then to get the details of the template, you'll notice that I called template programmer template and then the, the universe unique identifier of version five. Because what would happen is that there would be a different template or a different ID for each different version of the template. So this, this particular one is actually version five. And um, I'm just, for the purpose of debugging, this is uh, sample code, it's not production code, it's just to, to show, or educational code, it's just to show you uh, the API calls that are happening under the covers. So again, if I go and apply this template, um, you'll notice that what I've done here is um, I've taken the template, I've added the device that I'm going to apply it to, and then I've added the parameters. And um, this is just a JSON um, dictionary, and each of the variables, in the case VPN, has the value atom. Um, the prefixes is interesting because that's actually a list. And in that list of prefixes, I've got obviously a couple of uh, prefixes that I've defined, but that's an example of a list. And if you look at how the template works, it's actually running a for loop and it's going to take um, each prefix in the prefix list. So start off with 1.1.1.29 and then it's going to um, add a prefix to a particular VPN um, and it's going to update the sequence number. So the sequence number is going to start off at five, but it's going to be incremented by five each time the, leap go, the loop goes through. So I'm going to end up with five, 10, 15, 20, etc. So this is an example of quite a sophisticated uh, template because it's actually doing some control as well. Um, the simplest templates just have variables. Um, and you can see here, as I've run this, that I see the template body, I see the required parameters were uh, prefixes and VPN, and then I'm going to execute the template um, on the device. And you notice here that I get an error, and this is really important because I get an error saying that it's already deployed with the same parameters, so it's not going to deploy it again. <clears throat> and this is part of the, the semantics of the way that uh, DNA Center works. If you've already applied this template and it's had the same parameters supplied to it, then it's not going to, to do it again. Um, I could run that again and I could change one of the parameters. And I know this probably doesn't make sense, but just for the purpose of example. So if I was to run it again and change the parameters, then it would go and apply that template to the device because the parameters had changed. 
Now there is another way of getting around this because if I run this again and you notice that when I've run this I've got a, a success status that's come back. You can see the, the name of the prefix in the project. You can see all of the devices that it was applied to. I only gave it one. Um, the payload does take you, uh, allow you to provide multiples and each device will have its own set of parameters for the variables that are required. Um, and I've got a duration in terms of how long it took, uh, which was almost no time at all, two seconds. That's very quick. Um, if I was to run this again, it's gonna give me the same message, right? Because that template has already been applied. It's been applied with the same variables and it's not going to, to do it. Now, there are some use cases where you may wanna do this. Um, so I added the dash force option. There's actually an API parameter that you can um, use that will force the template to be applied. Uh, and you may wanna do this if you want to uh, just make sure that it always gets applied to the device. You know, the device might have rebooted or whatever. You wanna make sure that the, the configuration is, is pushed again uh, for whatever reason. And that's the way that you can do that. So I just know that there's a couple of people that have been caught by that in the past. So I just wanted to, to give you that example of how you can uh, to make that template be reapplied. Um, so these are the examples that I showed you. Um, this is all available on GitHub. And I should have said that earlier. So the code that I'm uh, showing you will be available on GitHub. Um, the previous example was as well. And just some notes. Um, you know, I mentioned that all templates are versions, so you need to save and commit. And there is an API to do this. So I just showed you uh, a very small set of the APIs. There are APIs for creating templates. There's APIs for updating templates, etc., deleting all the stuff that you could you could think of. Um, I mentioned the semantics of force push, force push template. Uh, so the default is not to reapply a template with the same variables. But if you if you were to use this um, option uh, as part of the payload, then you can force that to happen. And the default provisioning behavior is to apply a, a single or nested um, config to a device. Um, if you go through the provisioning workflow, then it will get other things like site-specific settings as part of the design phase for DNAC. So you'll be able to do things like AAA, NTP, etc. Um, the API will just push the template to the device. Uh, it won't necessarily push those site-specific settings. Um, and multiple devices uh, require unique parameters. So yes, I can have a list um, here in terms of what I push, but um, I would have a, a different set of um, values for each device that I'm going to, to apply this to. So if I was going to apply it to another device, I could just copy the, the same ones if I wanted to, but they are individual in terms of the payload. So it does allow me to provide different options for different variables for different types or, or different devices. Again, in the summary, these are just the APIs that I, I showed you in terms of the example. There's a lot more that you can see in terms of templates. So again, if I was to go to uh, DNA Center and take a look at the, the APIs under platform, and look at the way that these APIs are organized. Um, the way that they're organized is we've put them into categories. So know your network includes sites, network devices, clients, etc. Site management is where I can do things like plug and play. There's this notion of a site profile, which I'm not gonna cover here, and software image management. And the operational tools include things like Command Runner and Template Programmer. So if I take a look at Template Programmer, you can see that there's a quite a, a sophisticated uh, or extensive list of APIs in terms of um, creating projects, templates, applying them, deleting them, CRUD, except updating them, etc. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, day two, and this is the assurance piece. So assurance has been a, a very popular capability of DNA Center. Um, a lot of people have challenges around troubleshooting, network troubleshooting, visualization of how well the network is doing. Um, you know, everybody's probably heard the, the, the challenge of the moment there's an application um, issue, then everybody blames the network until the network team can prove that it's not their fault. Um, lots of uh, issues with, you know, the, how we troubleshoot and make troubleshooting the network uh, more, more efficient. So if I take a quick look at what um, Assurance gives me, 
you know, there's no shortage of data that we have around how well the network is doing. It's just that that data is not necessarily correlated and not necessarily abstracted so that we get a, an overall understanding of how well the network is doing. So the point behind assurance is that it takes a rich array of, of data sources, it correlates those, it aggregates those, and it abstracts those into a, a health score. So 100% is really good, um, zero is really bad, and anything else is, is something in between. So the way this works on, on DNA Center is that we provide a couple of different views of this. So there are two windows of the health of the network. One is the network devices themselves, um, and that's the thing that network engineers care about. So RAM, CPU, packet loss, etc. So how healthy are the network devices? Um, the challenge with that is that as a user of the network, I probably don't care. Um, what I care about is what's my experience like? How long did it take me to get on the network? Once I was on the network, um, what was my experience like in terms of accessing applications? So we tend to have these two views. There's the network um, health view of the devices themselves, and then there's the, the client view of how well the network is performing. Um, you can see here that my wireless clients have had some issues, and that's very deliberate. Um, in my lab, I've got a, a little uh, script running to cause some problems for wireless clients, because if this was all green like the wide one, then it'd be fairly boring. Um, and then the other thing we've done is we've given you the ability to look at this on a per site basis. So I can look at each of the sites. And again, I've got this concept of client health, network health, and I've actually broken it out even more. So in client health, I can see the health of the wired and wireless, uh, sorry, the wireless and the wired devices. I can see the health of the access, the, um, the core, the distribution, um, routers, um, wireless access points and other devices. So I've given, given you the ability to sort of break that down and, and you've got the ability to, to see on a site and even down to the floor basis, how well the network is performing in a, in a given location. So one of the challenges with this was that I found um, some of my customers were actually screen printing this because there wasn't any way to get access to this data. So this data is pretty cool, but they weren't able to get access to it. So that's something that's changed recently in that the APIs have allowed us to get access to these, these health scores and get access to a bunch of information uh, as part of the assurance piece. So if I, again, I've written a, a little script to um, make this a bit easier. So if you just run the um, assurance script here, it's going to make a couple of different calls. It's going to look at the site health, which is uh, essentially this page here, and it's going to show me the health of all of the sites, floors, etc. Um, and you can see what I've done is I've taken that information and I've done a, a very, or created a very crude table. So I've just pulled out a couple of things I thought were interesting for my particular use case. So I've got the site name, I've got the site type, I've got the issues, um, which is something that DNAC does. So DNAC is constantly looking in the background for uh, issues. There's about a hundred or so that are defined at the moment. And an issue is a, a complex event that um, may be impacting multiple things. So. It, it may only uh, be an individual device, so it may be a, an issue with a, an OSPF neighbourship, but it's, it's looking at a, a problem and giving me um, the number of issues in, in a particular site. So you can see at the moment my, my issues are none. Um, and then what it's doing is just pulling out the router health, the access switching health, the client health and the client count. Now there's all of the other information available, I just chose those particular ones because that was the, the example that I was using. You can see that my um, across all my sites, my router health is 100 and my access health is 60 on average, um, and my client health is, is 75. So you've got this aggregate, which is everything, and then you're able to drill down into particular places. So all buildings, um, I, again, I've got an aggregate, and because all of my um, sites are actually buildings, then you'd expect those to be the same. And then I can drill down into um, you know, some of the other air, uh, places like Sydney and St. Leonard's will have slightly different scores. So that's just uh, an example of, of you know, how some of this stuff works. Um, the next thing, and again, I've given you the API that you need to, to, uh, to call to do that. The other big thing about this is this notion of um, time stab. So one of the other things that people really like about um, the way that this works is that I've got the ability to go back in time or look at 
um, aggregated time. So I can look at the last seven days, last three hours, last 24 hours. And for these health scores, I can actually get those at a particular point. So uh, at this point, uh, sorry, for this particular call, I've just made it the most recent timestamp, um, which is the latest, um, but I could you know, pick it a, an earlier timestamp if I want to. And there's really two concepts here. So I've got, you know, a week's worth of data and I can look at it aggregated over that week. But then within that week, I can actually go to a specific point in time and look at what the device health score was at that point in time. Because the other issue that we see is that, you know, don't you love the conversation where someone says, Monday morning, I had a problem with the network on Friday afternoon. It's like, well, it's Monday morning now. So how am I supposed to troubleshoot your wireless issue um, on Friday afternoon? And this is a way that we can do that. Uh, so in this particular case, the default is just the last time period. Um, I can also get the client health. So in this particular case, I'm, um, I'm looking at the client health. And what I'm doing here is getting um, the current client health score across um, all of the wired and wireless devices. Uh, you'll notice here that I've provided a timestamp. Um, this timestamp um, is the same timestamp up here. I, it was just optional up here, so I, I chose a specific one down here. It happens to be the latest one. Um, the way the timestamp works is that it's uh, epoch, um, milliseconds. So if you were to decode that particular, uh, that is the number of epoch seconds, and then you times a thousand to get epoch milliseconds. Um, I've given you the range here, so it's a five minute window and it's a rolling five minute window. Um, so we calculate it uh, all the time and it's a rolling five minute window that we, we calculate in terms of the health score. So here you can see that the wired, I've got all 13 clients, I've got nine of them are wired. I've got one of the nine has um, poor health and the root cause is actually DHCP. So one of my clients on the network has a, a DHCP issue. Um, there are eight clients that are good. And in wireless, I have four clients, um, two have poor health. Um, one is due to some unknown reason and the other one is because of authentication. So one of them has an authentication reason and the other one has some other issue that we're not quite sure about. Um, then if I look at, uh, so that's the client view, and then I can give, also give you the network view. So essentially what this is doing is um, the site health, the, the client view, and then the network view. And again, in the network view, I've just taken a, a very simple approach. I looked at the network health for the current period, um, which is 3.31 a.m., because that's the Sydney time. Um, I've got 17 devices that are monitored, two that are unmonitored. Um, of those devices, you got 60% um, health, and one with a very poor, with uh, errors and routers are good, wireless is okay, um, and the APs are okay. So that's a, just a very simple way of um, getting the, uh, the overall health. The other thing that I can do is, which I think I've done here, ah, I can provide, um, I can look at it in terms of specific timestamp. So you notice that um, I ran it with the latest timestamp. Um, and if I was to run it again, that would be different, but I can provide a, a specific timestamp. Um, and just for the purpose of example, oops, I made that too long. I'll just run it with the same one. Oops, I've just, uh, actually that was something I needed to fix. So I've just uh, broken the, the timestamp check, so I'll, I'll get that sorted. Um, it does support a timestamp and I need to update my code, which I will do. Um, what else was gonna show you? The other thing you can do, which uh, is kind of useful, is you can run it in raw mode. And what that does is just give you the, the raw JSON that comes back. So instead of me pseudo formatting it, I'm just giving you everything that I get. And you can see that there's a lot of information here. So I just gave you a very small um, subset of the information that came back uh, just for education, but you can see that there is a lot of information that I have um, from all of these API calls. So that's uh, that's one thing I wanted to show you. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can get um, 
the health score for a particular device. So in this, in this case, it's a specific client. And what this is going to do is get some client details. Um, I can give it a timestamp so I can debug the, the 5 p.m. Friday afternoon issue and look at where this particular device was connected. And when I do this, you can see that I get the client detail for the, the particular device at a particular time, which is 3.44 in the morning. Um, it's a wireless client. I know where it's connected. I know the protocol, which is AC. I know it's band five, it's channel 36, the width and the streams. Um, and then I also know who's logged into that device. It's the IP address, so it's 10.1, sorry, 10.11.120.11. The username is Brad. Um, it's an Apple device, I know that. Its health is nine. It's connected to the SDA SSID, which is a five gig um, SSID. That SDA SSID is running on 3804 underscore SDA um, access point, which has this particular IP address. It's this particular model number, um, and I need to change the name of it. Um, it's running this version of code. Its health score is 10. And that access point is connected to this particular wireless phone controller, which is a 3804 with this particular IP address. Um, this is the model number, the version of code, and it's got a health score of 10. So all of this is just um, accessible with a single API call. Um, similarly, if I wanted to find out about the health of the device itself, um, so that 3504, um, I'm just looking up that host name, um, that's going to give me, oops, that's going to give me the device name. Um, need to change my example. Um, and that's going to make a device detail call. Again, I can provide a, a timestamp. And essentially, it's just giving me a, a very small amount of information for that, that network device. It's a wireless line controller. Um, it doesn't give me any extra information around where it's connected, etc. Uh, so that's a very simple example of um, the way that those uh, assurance APIs work. Um, so those are some examples. Um, the other thing that we're able to do is we're able to um, get some more detailed information. So this is the health concept. Um, if I was to drill down into the client health and look at why uh, some devices or some users might be having issues, I can do that. Um, you'll notice that my wireless client health wasn't perfect. Um, it was float, floating up and down. Um, if I come down into client health, you can see that I've got um, the client health historically. It's the last 24 hours, but I can change that to whatever time range I want. Uh, you can see when it's under or over this um, 40% threshold, uh, I can go across that. Then I can look down and see a Sankey of the four active um, clients. I can see that two are not onboarded. One's due to an, a AAA issue. One's due to some other issue. And two are onboarded and they're okay. And similarly in the wired, a wired space, <clears throat> I've got one wired client that has an issue. Um, I got a whole lot of other information here about the client onboarding time, so how long it took to get onto the network, once they are onto the network, what's the received signal strength and the signal to noise ratio. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I have um, access to here. So if I was to drill in and look again at the, the clients that are having issues, you can see here that there's um, a particular user that has a problem. Um, both of these actually have, have issues here. And I can drill down into a specific um, device and get a lot more information. Now, this, um, this is called a Client360, and the whole idea of this is that we're trying to give you all of the information about this particular device in the one place. So I can see that this is a Raspberry Pi, um, I can see um, its health score has been bad, I can see it's tried to authenticate a whole bunch of times, and it's essentially having issues with, with doing that. I can see um, signal strength, signal to noise, bytes transmitted, received. Um, I can see issues and events that have occurred when it's tried to get onto the network. Um, so there's a whole lot of information that I have. I've got the topology so I can see where it's trying to connect, how it's trying to connect. And then this event viewer gives me a breakdown of 
um, all of the uh, of the onboarding process and and what's going on. So I can, I can click down in and see that it tried to do a web auth, um, and essentially that that got timed out. So it associated, um, got an IP, um, it tried to do a web auth, and then it got kicked off. Uh, that information is available via an API. Um, so there is a, um, a little example that I have um, for that. So this particular device, um, I think I just say dash Mac. Um, and again, I, I, well, for this particular example, I'm just going to give you the, the raw information. And you can see for this particular user, I've got a lot of information around what's going on. So I've got the, the MAC address, I've got the, um, the type of device that it's connected. So this is the device that it's connected to, which is this particular AP. So I've got all of the information about the AP. I've got the neighbor topology. Um, and for that, I've got uh, the number of clients, 2.4 and 5 gig that are connected to that device. Um, I've got the, the switch that is upstream I've got the wireless LAN controller that it's connected to, and then the, the links between those, whether they're, how well they're performing. And then I've got a, a lot of information about the user. So I've got the client type, I've got the host name, I've got the user ID, um, I've got the subtype, frequency, so transmit, receive, bytes, um, SSID, whether there was DNS issues or not, um, the location, there's a heap of information here that I have around um, the health score. So the overall health score as well as the onboarding and connected. So the overall health score is actually the sum of the onboarding and connected scores. Um, the channel, there's the amount of time that it's spent in each of the phases. So, you know, did it do DHCP okay? Um, did it authenticate okay? There's a heap of information that I have um, access to via that, that API call. So this is an example. Um, the only thing you need to be careful of here is the way that this works is that, um, that we use headers um, to pass the entity type, which is the MAC address and then the value. So if I'm after this particular user's MAC address, then I need to provide that. I can do the user ID as well. So in, the entity type would be network user ID and the entity value would be Brad. And that would do the same or give me exactly the same information here as, um, well, actually not for this one, but for the one that I showed you earlier because the user for this particular device was Brad. So it would, um, it would tell me, uh, it would give me the, exactly the same thing. Uh, so that's an example of, of user enrichment. Um, one thing that people commonly get confused with is that these APIs, the Assurance APIs, uh, by default run asynchronously. And if you do that, then what happens is you get a job back that you then need to go and poll. So it's like a double get. If you don't want to do that, which I don't, then you need to make sure that the double underscore run sync equal true um, header is provided. And that means that you'll get the result back straight away in the, the way that I did here. Um, the timestamp, which is used uh, consistently is in milli epochs. So you divide by a thousand to get epoch seconds. Um, there's a finite history for data. So at the moment it's seven days and the user enrichment um, APIs use headers, not query parameters for the MAC address, etc. Um, this is just a summary and just made the point around the entity type and entity value as being um, headers. Okay, so final thing was day N. Um, what I wanted to cover here was software image management. Um, this is the feature inside DNAC where we can uh, upgrade code. So if you look at the provisioning page here, I've got the ability to um, define what's called a golden image. So you can see here that this particular device is outdated. And the reason that it's outdated is that um, I've defined a, a golden image of 16.64 and it's running 16.62. Uh, so this is something that it's automatically picked up. Um, 
the way that that's set is it's part of the design so I can define a golden image on a per device basis so all cat 9ks run 1664 I can do it on a roll basis so any cat 9k that's running as an access which should run 1664 and I can also drill down into a location so any um, cat 9k running in Tokyo uh, which is where I am at the moment running in edge device should be running 1664 all cat 9ks in Tokyo should be running 1664 so I've got a bit of flexibility there um, what happens uh, then is once I've, if I want to change this, I've got a provision, sorry, not a provision. If I want to change this, I can update the operating system. Um, whoa. If I want to change this, I can update the operating system. So I can um, update OS image. And what will happen is I've got two things. I can do a distribute and an activation. And just recently we've split these out so I can distribute now, but I can then activate later. So I can activate it at a future point in time, or I can actually skip activation altogether and just do the distribution piece if I wanted to. So I could push all the code out and then at a later time I could go in um, and activate that code. So I've got full control over how I was able to do this. Um, there is a pre-check that gets run, so you can see here that there's a bunch of checks that happens in terms of um, common issues, so making sure there's enough flash, making sure I can transfer appropriately. We use HTTPS or SCP, so you notice here in this case I've turned off HTTPS, so I can do a distribution via um, secure copy, um, which is good. And um, all I would need to do then is just go and um, push that out. Now. All of this is available via APIs. So some people would like to automate this and integrate this into some other process. So there, it is possible to, um, to do that. Uh, in this case, I've got some examples where um, I can just look at all of the images that are running on the device, uh, sorry, on DNAC, so I can see all of the images that I have um, I can search for a particular, so you can see here, this is the, the inventory of images that I have. I can automate these um, images, so you can see that this was actually imported directly from CCO, so I can do that. I can import it from the file system as well if I want to. I need to have my CCO credentials in DNAC to do that, but I can actually choose to automate or download an image directly. Um, this is an example of one that I created earlier. The distribution takes a long time. Um, so all I would need to do is I'd say distribute.py um, and then I'm using this concept of a tag. So in 1.25 we added device tags. So any devices that are tagged with upgrade 9k um, would get um, this image which is 16.64 pushed out to them. Um, and you can see the APIs that are going on in the background. I'm doing some interesting things around the tags to get the number of um, switches that match. And then um, I'm pushing out to this particular device the appropriate image and that's being distributed. So you can see that that takes quite a long time. In this case, in this particular um, nine case case, it's a long time because it's behind a, a very slow pseudo or simulated wide area link. But just to give you the, um, so it timed out, or at least the job did, I just need to increase the timeout. But just to give you the, the uh, show you an example of how easy it is to to push that image out and then I could activate it if I want to. I can do it in one shot if I want to as well, but uh, normally the process is to push it out and then to activate it. Um, so that's something that is quite easy to do. Um, the Swim application can only upgrade to the golden image by default. Um, I mentioned that. With the APIs, however, I can upgrade to whatever image I want. So. I can choose any one of these images and if it's appropriate, push it out to the device and activate it on the device. Um, the other thing that we're working on is this notification, uh, concept of notification and events. Um, I don't have time to cover it now, but um, Hank's doing another uh, session later on and uh, next year and I'll talk about the event framework and how you can get swim events pop out and you can see those and handle those so I can get notified that an image is not or a device is out of compliance and I could then use that to use the APIs to, to, uh, to make that change. So this is a concept of push notifications. Um, and then the final thing is you need to resync DNA Center to show the device is upgraded. So the default resync interval is 25 minutes. You can actually do that by the API as well. 
Um, so this is just a summary of some of the APIs that I showed you. Um, I'm not gonna cover this now because I think we'll cover this next time, but basically there's a whole range of um, integrations that we're planning in terms of uh, what we've got in terms of ITCM integration. Um, this concept of web hooks and push notifications around events, around um, CMDB and also around um, swim app, uh, issues. The concept of polling versus notification, I thought, I'm sure everybody gets that, but that's essentially what we're doing here. And in terms of what we've got available today, we've got Swim Compliance, which is generic. We've got issues that you can send to a generic webhook. And then we've got some specific things around ServiceNow, around CMDB um, inventory, sorry, CMDB inventory, software image management and issues. Okay, so I think that's, I'm pretty close to end of time. So I just want to hand back to Hank and uh, let him wrap up. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Um, so this gave us a good layout of the basics and the introduction to the DNA Center APIs. And as Adam mentioned, we'll be covering more topics on DNA Center in next season. So as always, we pull together a series of webinar resources that you can take a look at. So if you wanna check out the API documentation, you can find that up on um, up off of uh, DevNet, as well as different learning labs to dive into some of these ca uh, capabilities and examples. If you don't have your own DNA Center appliance, we have several of them available in Sandbox, so you can take advantage of our always on Sandboxes or even reserve one if you wanna have a little bit more flexibility for that. And then we always like to provide some sort of a code challenge as we move out of a Net DevOps Live. And so we've seen some examples of the different APIs, put them to use, build a Python script that simplifies some operational task or some configuration task that you're after in your own environment, and then submit that up to Code Exchange so folks can take a look at what's there. And as always, we've got tons of great resources up on just Net DevOps topics in general. So visit developer.cisco.com slash Net DevOps, check out the blogs, uh, and be sure to check out all of the different content that we've got in the Net DevOps Live series. Here's the contact information. So if you do want to stay in contact with the information that's out there, you can keep in touch with Adam up on uh, WebEx Teams or email, as well as Twitter and GitHub. And then as always, be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias for the latest and programmable information. Which brings us to the end. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And thanks to Adam for such a great session full of different examples and demo code examples to go through on that. We will see you all next week, and we will talk soon. Thanks. <laughs>